Chapter 921 Runesmithing Part 1 The two different magical rings shared two out of three sets of runes. The first set would enhance Litha's energy signature so that the mana flow originating from the crystals embedded into the rings would offer less resistance to the forge mastering process. The second set amplified the effects of the ring's pseudocore, allowing it to be temporarily boosted when necessary. The third set of the magic holding ring allowed for energy manipulation so that the spell could be used a little at a time instead of being released in one go. Also, as long as the stored spell wasn't completely spent, the runes made it possible to recharge or amplify it on the fly. In the case of the barrier ring, instead, the third set contained a complex preset code that would allow the ring to channel Litha's mana into a spirit magic barrier, even if he had no idea how to do it himself. Both rings required three mana crystals each. Two had to be embedded close to each other and facing outside, to project the mana outwards, whereas the third crystal would be in contact with the palm of the wearer to more easily draw upon their mana. During the first day, Lith practiced engraving the sets of runes one by one, wasting quite the number of cheap rings. This time he couldn't use pebbles because, for runesmithing, with the shape of the item he wanted to craft also varied the spacing between runes. Only when he became not only capable of engraving all runes correctly, but also to keep the distances between the different sets so that they wouldn't mess with each other, did he start working on the final hurdle. Before attempting to forge master the ring with the purified aura calcum, Lith had yet to convert the ancient engraving method in the modern fashion. Old runes would be always visible, giving away the nature of their enchantment and betraying Litha's success in raiding the lost academy of Heriol. Modern engraving, instead, would project the energy of the runes inward, making them invisible to the naked eye. The process was tricky because the booklet at Litha's disposal only explained the old method, and he could only study ruin to understand how modern engraving worked. Explain that to me again, please. Lith massaged his temples after one failure too many. Okay, ancient forge masters would physically carve the surface of the objects so that the engravings would serve as both a beacon for their mana and as a template for the runes. The downside of this method is that the runes are isolated from the mana circulatory system of the item, so they act as separate entities, Solus said. Modern forge masters, instead, shape their mana as runes on their own before applying them on the surface of an item. This way, the energy released by the runes is not restricted by the physical carvings and can circulate throughout the artifact. The process makes them invisible to normal means of detection and able to alter the properties of both the metal and its mana circulatory system. Once the enchantment is applied, the final result is given from the synergy between the runes and the pseudocore, creating something that's greater than the sums of its single parts. The downside of this method is that it requires great focus. You must remember the runes that comprise each set and shape all of them to perfection at the same time. The slightest mistake in their form or positioning will lead to failure. How the heck do Royal Forge Master achieve such precision with fake magic? Lith asked in frustration. The rings Solus had studied were among the simplest creations a runesmith could craft, yet they required 30 runes each that were as small as they were complex. My guess is they have some kind of crutch, like the special ink they use to draw the magic circles for the forge mastering process. She said, Solus, I love you. Lith jumped up and tried to take her between his arms, but she popped away, letting the forge mastering hammer fall to the ground with a silvery sound. I meant that you're a genius and that you may have offered me a solution. Meaning, an incorporeal voice asked, I'll show you. Lith took a bottle of special ink out of his pocket dimension and used water magic to draw with it three magic circles, one for each set of runes. Then, just like when he was still a fourth-year student at the academy, Lith infused them with his mana. The ink absorbed the mystical energy, acting as a template for their final form. The runes grew in power and splendor, keeping the right shape with minimal effort from Litha's side. 
I've never been so glad to have worked as assistant professor at the White Griffin. I know the recipe for the ink like the back of my hand. We can mass produce it in your alchemical lab, Lith said. That's brilliant thinking. Luckily, we're both geniuses. Solus finally reappeared, embracing Lith with joy. Thanks for the compliment. By the way, nice double standards for hugs. Lith clicked his tongue, preparing for the final phase of the experiment. To replicate a pseudocore with true magic, first Lith had to study its version obtained with fake magic. He used the special ink to draw and apply the runes to a cheap ring before bonding it with the three mana crystals required for the craft. I wish I could use cheap crystals as well. What kind of madman would waste precious resources for teaching to kids? He said in anguish. Green crystals are cheap. Also, pot, meat kettle. You went to an academy that wasted a lot of resources on you, remember? Solus said. That was a different case. Different how? She asked. I wasn't the one paying for them. Lith started to chant the spell, preventing her from quoting his own rebuke about double standards. The crafting went without a hitch, producing the lowest grade barrier ring a mage could conceive and turn their nose at. Lith studied the ring's pseudocore and how it interacted with the runes when an external flow of mana activated its enchantment. Now comes the part one hate the most. Prototypes. Lith sighed. Prototypes had to be as close as possible to the real deal, hence to craft them Lith had to use high-quality materials. Otherwise, the gap in physical properties and mana flow between the prototype and the final product would add unpredicted variables to the crafting process. For that reason, the prototypes required smelted orichalcum rings bonded with blue mana crystals. It took Solus and Lith more than two weeks to fine-tune the entire process and iron out the final details. He already had Zekel turn the piece of purified orichalcum into three thick silvery rings, so he could afford up to three tries. The first step was bonding three purple mana crystals with the orichalcum, giving it a circulatory mana system akin to that of a living being. According to the booklet from Heriol, the order of bonding and runesmithing could be swapped, but Lith had learned the truth the hard way. Only when using outdated runesmithing techniques, the preparatory steps didn't require to be performed in sequence, and that was because external runes didn't interact with the enchantment. Chapter 922 Runesmithing Part 2 Lith, instead, used ancient runes but modern techniques, so that applying the runes before the bonding caused distortions in the circulatory mana system due to the rejection between Lith's energy signature from the runes and that of the crystals. Applying runes was the step Lith had less experience with, and it was crucial. He would have liked to have all the surface of the ring available for the runes and bond the gems only after the runesmithing process, but unfortunately, it turned out to be impossible. Bonding and runesmithing both created a circulatory mana system, but while the former was highly susceptible to external influences and would change its course based on the obstacles that it met, the latter would relentlessly follow the instructions embedded in the runes. Only after the purple crystals had become one with the metal and their circulatory mana system was stabilized could Lith move to the second step, runesmithing. The sets of runes would seep inside the orichalcum, spreading their veins through its whole structure and relying on Lith's mana to overcome the resistance generated by the presence of the crystals. Fascinating. Solus thought while examining the complex network of mana channels the two preparatory steps had created. It's as if the crystals created arteries that spread the mana evenly while the runes created veins that will allow the residual energy to return to the pseudocore without overloading the ring. All that is left is the heart. You made an interesting parallel, Solus, but it's more than that. The runes also carry my energy signature, so with each set I engraved, I reduced the rejection between the mana generated by the crystals and my own, making the forge mastering process easier. Lith thought, Now I understand why the booklet is so adamant about the correct positioning for both crystals and runes. A slight alteration is all that it takes to turn a masterpiece into an utter failure.
Then, Lith performed the third and last step, Necroforge. Each failed prototype had made his wallet bleed, but at the same time had brought the process closer to perfection. Without runes, Lith couldn't create a pseudo-core holding more than half of his magical force, otherwise the amplification effect of the aura calcum would boost the pseudo-core to the point that Lith couldn't overcome the rejection between the two different energy signatures. The ancient runesmithing technique raised the limit to 60% while using the ancient runes, and what Lith assumed were modern runesmithing techniques brought it up to 75%. I guess I'll need Faluel's teachings to reach 100%. Oh well, this is still a great training. He thought while resting, preferring to save invigoration for Necro Forge. Such forge mastering technique required him to shape the pseudocore outside its future recipient and then merge them together before creating the necessary mana pathways to make it permanent. By creating a complete pseudocore, Lith had all the time he wanted to shape it with surgical precision and charge it with enough energy to fuel the enchantments he wanted to create. The downside of Necroforge was that injecting a powerful energy mass inside inanimate matter would encounter a lot of resistance and put a huge amount of stress on its recipient. To make matters worse, the pseudocore was likely to be deformed in the process, and fixing it would require consuming more mana and focus. The pseudocore had to retain a perfect shape after having been placed inside the mana circulatory system before Lith could add the correct number of mana pathways necessary to stabilize the artifact. Mana pathways were artificial energy conduits that anchored the pseudocore, trapping its wild energies in a loop that prevented them from being dispersed due to a magical item's inanimate nature. The number of necessary mana pathways depended on the pseudocore's strength. Too few and the mana forming the core would be dispersed, too many and it would crumble. Lith first created the pseudocore between his hands, giving it perfect size and proportions. Invigoration allowed him to see in detail both his own creation and the mana core crafted with fake magic, so that by comparing them he could fix any mistake. Then, he made it engulf the ring. At first, the purified aura calcum absorbed the pseudocore like a sponge does with water. After a while, however, the flow of energy bearing Litha's energy signature and that bearing the three purple crystals were matched in power. The pseudocore started to distort, forcing Lith to stop and restore its shape. At that point, he wielded his enchanted forge mastering hammer and used Solus's help to overcome the rejection caused by the two conflicting energies. Solus had now to split both her focus and the world energy coming from the mana geyser between the magic circle and the hammer. Without the former, the mystical energies of the forge mastering process would dissipate, while without the latter lith would lack the strength to imbue such powerful magic into the ring. Each time the Forge Mastering Hammer was filled to the brim with mana coming from Lith and Solus, it would strike at the enchanted ring, emitting a blinding pulse of blue light that was captured by the circle and channeled into the ongoing spell. The purified aura calcum offered little resistance to the mana flow compared with its just smelted counterpart. The phenomenon had allowed the energy coming from the purple crystals to form a complex mana circulatory system that filled every nook and cranny of the ring. Luckily, the same happened for the runes, whose network of mana capillaries constantly mixed Litha's mana with that coming from the crystals and made the forge mastering process possible. It's incredible. Lith thought, I have barely started and the procedure would have already failed if not for the runes. The secondary mana circulatory system the runes create not only allows the mana from the pseudocore to freely flow inside the ring as if I had already added a few mana pathways, but it also stabilizes the pseudocore so that even under the energy amplifying effect of the aura calcum, the number of imperfections that arise is fewer than ever. The more the pseudocore seeped inside the ring, the more it grew in size and power. What had started as a construct with only 75% of Litha's power had already reached 90% on its own and would soon go over 100%. A Forge Master couldn't imbue a spell stronger than his own magical power. 
It was the reason why having multiple mages powering up a magical circle was useless and why Lith needed the hammer. With it, Solus could add a power boost from the tower and made it possible for them to overcome their limits. By the time the pseudocore had reached the center of the mana circulatory system, it had grown to 120% of Lith power. All he had left to do was to create the mana pathways to complete the process. With each mana pathway Lith created, the two conflicting energy signatures coming from the pseudocore and the crystals started to mix. The violence of the clashes between them progressively faded until they became one. It's done. Lith immediately imprinted the barrier ring and put its capabilities to the test. A sphere of emerald light surrounded him, protecting him from any kind of danger. Lith made the barrier shrink until it barely wrapped him while he was in a crouched position and expand up to a two meters, six, six feet, radius. The mana required varied greatly with the barrier's size and energy density. Chapter 9, 23 Birthdays, Part 1 What do you think, Solus? Lith asked. That for a ring that required simple ingredients and a single pseudocore, took a lot of effort making it. A skinwalker armor uses four pseudocores at once, and if they all grow up to 120% your maximum magical power, it will take 480% of your output to make just one. The runes we have currently available are not up to the task. Any attempt to craft a masterpiece is doomed to fail. She said, Hey, being a pessimist is my thing. You should be the one looking at the bright side. I mean, we wasted no purified orichalcum and can make more rings. Lith replied, I'm sorry. It's just that, even if you can't notice it, under my golden glow I'm green with envy. Solus was gripping her own hammer as hard as she could in frustration. She was staring at the ring without floating around as usual. Her head was low and her shoulders slouched, making her look even smaller than she was. What good is having a hammer, having my body, if all I do is watch from the sidelines? She said. Is this really all that the future holds for me? Being your second? I don't know. Lith was shocked and hurt by her suffering, but he didn't want to give her false hope or empty words. All I can tell you is that I'll do my best to give you the life you deserve. I'm sorry for always being so egotistical. Saying that I got distracted by the latest load of crap is no excuse since it happened to both of us. Would you like to work on the magic holding ring? This time you lead and I follow. Lith said. Really? Solus lifted her head, brimming with joy. Really? Do you promise me to not get angry, even if I waste all the purified orichalcum we've left? I promise. Compared to your happiness, it's just scrap metal. He said, hugging her. Thank you so much. I promise you I'll do my best to gift you a masterpiece worthy of Master Mina Dion. She replied while losing herself in his warmth and hoping that moment would never end. Don't worry about it. Worst case scenario, once I master Origin Flames, we can always recycle the metal. He said with a mocking tone. I hate you, damn son of a gun. You ruined this moment for me. Yet she refused to let him go. Between the real vacation and the experiments on runes, Litha's birthday was coming up so fast that he would have forgotten about it if everyone else didn't keep reminding him. Solus was ecstatic at the idea of meeting all Litha's old friends, Camilla was terrified, and his whole family was as thrilled as if he was going to become president of Mogur instead that just one year older. Tista had finally managed to come back from her mission, and she almost had a heart attack after learning about how close Rena had got to losing her children. I'm so sorry, big sis. I don't know how could I miss it. She repeated many times until Rena hit Tista on the head with a slipper, just to make her shut up. It's not your fault, dimwit. Lith explained to me that lungs develop late, and by then you were already gone. I can't possibly ask neither of you to give up on your life every time I get pregnant. Rena loved her sister, but being constantly reminded of the narrow escape while the pregnancy term was so close made her cranky big time. 
but it must be my fault somehow. I'm the only one in the family who ever suffered from the strangler. Somehow I must have passed it on the baby. Tista sobbed. Sure. You fell ill for the fun of it, and then you dived into my belly to infect my baby without me noticing. Do you even realize the amount of nonsense you are spouting? Rena held Tista tight, cradling her little sister in her arms. Rena had helped Alina taking care of her siblings since she could remember. She had changed their cloth diapers, fed them, and rocked them until they fell asleep when they were ill. To her, Lith and Tista were more like her children than siblings. Sure, Lith rarely cried or fell ill even as a newborn, but it didn't make him any less precious in Rena's eyes. Lith watched the scene, feeling moved by the bond between the two sisters. I could tell them that in theory, it's mom's fault since she has passed onto us defective genes, but I think it would only make everything worse and kill mom in the process. It's better if they think it was just bad luck. Lith thought, by the way, when do you plan on telling them about you being a hybrid? Solis asked. First, there is my social event birthday with the Ernas, my academy professors, and all those people that I worked hard to avoid during the rest of the year. I can't risk my family being so upset that they might be forced to cancel the event. I'll wait for my private birthday party at the Verhen household. Lith thought, are you scared? Half to death. To be honest, I can't wait for Rena to deliver the babies. With my luck, I'm afraid that it will either happen during the social event or right before I start shapeshifting in front of my family. Lith sighed. Fate for once seemed to listen to his wishes because Rena went into labor just a few hours later, in the middle of the night. Lith, of course, welcomed the news by cursing at his bad luck and calling Faluel. Alina set the heating to the maximum while preparing hot water and clean cloths for the arrival of the magical midwife. Excellent thinking, Alina. I could use a hot tea to shake the cold off my poor bones. Faluel wrapped herself in the cloths and added tea leaves, mint, and hydra strong alcohol to the pot containing the water. Winter had finally arrived in its full might, with below zero temperatures, cloudy sky, and plenty of snow. All things that Faluel hated. She gulped down the entire pot in front of the flabbergasted Alina. That's much better. Now, I need everyone who's not a healer to stay out of my hair, Faluel said with a burp before moving to Rena's bedchamber and kicking out everyone but Lith and Tista. Now watch and learn, she said, placing her hands on Rena's hips. A white light engulfed the woman in labor, enhancing the elasticity of her skin and muscles. Then, the hydra manipulated the rhythm of the contractions along with the hardness and softness of the tissues. The babies came out one after the other in less than five minutes since Faluel's arrival. While the siblings cut the umbilical cords and cleaned the babies, the Hydra kept working on her patient. Tista was flabbergasted noticing that whatever the Hydra had done, it had prevented the formation of stretch marks and reverted Rena's figure to that she had before becoming pregnant. What? How? As far as she knew, not even Minoher could make a delivery that easy. Mostly because he would rather commit treason than work as a midwife. Chapter 924 Birthdays Part 2 Experience Faluel said with a sigh, wrapping the babies in warm cloths before handing them to Rena. You seem to be an interesting young lady, dear Litha's sister. I hope we'll meet again in warmer circumstances. Bye. Faluel disappeared so fast that Tista could only choke on all her questions while Rena found herself thanking empty air. She felt chipper and energetic as if instead of giving birth to triplets, she had just returned from a day in a spa. Lith, how do you think I should call them? Rena asked. Why do you ask me instead of Sentin? Well, because I got four healers to thank for this miracle, but only three babies. Someone has to be left out this time. Rena replied. Only three? This time. Lith didn't know whether to be more horrified at his sister belittling the workload the little monsters in her arms demanded from the whole family or the idea she might get pregnant again. 
On one hand, I already named Lyria after you, but on the other, it's you who brought Faluel here and even helped me in the delivery. I'm not going to lie, I have no clue what part Quilla played in the procedure, let alone that guy whose name I don't even remember. Rena kept thinking out loud, uncaring of the noise that the babies and the members of the family who had finally had access to the room made. Alina was crying with joy. Senton was asking the healers of the family if everyone was all right. Tista was demanding answers about Faluel's identity, and everyone wanted to hold the children. Even Aaron and Lyria wanted to help with the newborns. Look, I don't care who you name them after. The only thing that matters is that all of you are all right. Just some friendly advice. We can't have the whole family starting with the L, so you should name a kid after Zekel. Lith pointed his finger at Senton without him noticing. I disagree. Senton said to Rena, I love my parents, but it's not because of them that we were able to marry, and I can't forget all the help your family gave to us, so I'd rather name one of our children after Alina, if that's okay with you. His words made Alina cry harder and the babies, scared by the noise, decided to tag along in a choir that crushed Lith's ears. After a long debate that Lith avoided by asking Zinya for sanctuary, the three new members of the Verhen family received their names. Falco was the baby boy suffering from the Strangler disease, named after the person that had allowed him to survive against all odds. The baby girl was named Turyon after Tista and Nessa after Naurind, who had kept her safe during the procedure. Rina chose Turyon as first name to thank her sister. It was only thanks to her loving care that nothing bad had ever happened during Litha's absence. Last, but not least, Leonard Quanter was named after his uncle for having made the impossible possible time and time again. One week later, Erna's mansion. The gala associated with Litha's birthday took place the evening before the private party, so that on the stroke of midnight the two events overlapped and both took place on the correct date. The gala would usually be held at Martianus Miram de Star's household since she was the ruler of the Marquiate, of which both Lucia and the White Griffin were part. That year, however, Orion had insisted to be the host and guarantee the safety of all the guests. Martianus de Star didn't let him repeat his offer twice, glad to leave the burden to someone else. Between her duty as ruler of the Distar region and supreme commander of the Queen's Corps, she had barely seen the light of day ever since the undead invasion had begun. It's been a long time since we could have a friendly chat, isn't it? She said. The Martianess was a woman in her early forties, but even without the perfect makeup she wore, it would have been hard to consider her a day older than thirty. She had a beautiful face with great proportions, eyes brimming with intelligence and curiosity. She wore her waist-long hair straight down, with only her golden cloaking hairpin and a diamond tiara to adorn it. She had dark brown hair with shades of blue all over that made it almost hypnotic to look at her whenever the Martianess shook her head. Her evening dress was of a pale red, showing a shallow neckline and covering her shoulders, but leaving her arms exposed. I'd like to take full credit for it, but you're a hard woman to find. Lith took two glasses of red wine from a waiter, offering one to his old patron. That's true, she said while resisting the temptation to drink the wine in one gulp. Just the idea of the workload waiting for her back at Distar was giving her a headache. Have you thought about the direction you want to give your career once you are done with the military service? I know for sure there are a lot of open positions in the army and the mage association that would be a perfect fit for a man of your talents. The Martianess tried to sound casual, but it was part of the duty that Queen Silpha herself had entrusted Miram with. The queen was attending the gala as well, but she couldn't afford to make such direct questions. Only a fool would say no to a queen, and every one of her words might be mistaken for a threat. I did. Lith nodded. I'm interested in pursuing magic, so I've already found a mentor that will allow me to bring my specializations to the next level. Is it someone I know? That wasn't the answer the Martianess was hoping for. Lith becoming a member of one of the two forces under the direct command of the royals was in the kingdom's best interest, 
but even if he married into an ancient magical bloodline, it would still leave the crown some leeway, especially if his in-laws were people of proven loyalty, like the Ernas. With all due respect, I doubt you know all the emperor beasts of kingdom. Lith decided it was better to leave Faluel's name out of the conversation. With all that there was at stake, he couldn't afford any meddling in his private affairs. Emperor Beasts? I believe that the Royal Forge Masters or one of the six great academies can offer you more than any beast can. It was only thanks to years of experience receiving bad news that the Martianess managed to not spit her drink all over the priceless silk carpet at their feet. Indeed, but for a price that I'm not willing to pay, at least for now. Lith made sure to leave room for negotiation. It was better to not burn bridges he could later use. Price? What price? The kingdom would provide you with lands, wealth beyond your imagination, and all the rarest ingredients you might need. The Martianess performed her best pitch, and in exchange it would ask my time, put my loyalty to the test, and give me so many responsibilities that I would be dependent on the kingdom's support even to blow my own nose. Thank you, but no thank you. Litha's smile was kind, yet it had, I don't believe, in free meals written all over it. Chapter 925, Secret Meeting, Part 1 I don't mean to be pushy, but ever since you enrolled in the White Griffin, you have done a great service to the kingdom and have been paid accordingly. Why this sudden change of heart? Martianus Distar asked, who has offered her heart, body, and soul to the kingdom more than Floria Ernas? Litha's voice was stone cold. Yet it didn't save her from suffering an unjust fate. She's still just a captain, isn't she? Yours is a rash judgment. Nothing has been decided and she could be acquitted at any time. The Martianus was now on shaky ground. Floria's still ongoing trial was a sour note that all the friends and the enemies of the Ernas played constantly. The former demanded acquittal and an apology, while the latter demanded an exemplary punishment. A trial that should not have even started and yet in a few months it will become one year old. If politics can push a family as powerful as the Ernas to such a degree, I'd rather stay out of it before it turns my blessings into curses. How is Brinja? Lith asked. In the Griffin Kingdom's social circles, asking about a relative was the polite way to put an end to a discussion. The Martianus caught his drift and moved the conversation to less controversial topics, like the development of Lustria County. Care to join us, Traquil? She had noticed for a while the excitable man waiting for the right moment chime in. The future of the kingdom or of a great mage were out of the reach of a countryside noble. With pleasure, dear Martianus. Count Lark literally jumped at the occasion, making his monocle pop out of the eye socket. Count Lark hadn't changed much since the last time Lith had seen him in person. He was in his late fifties, around one, eighty-three meters, six foot, tall with a thin build that made him appear even taller. The Count had thick black hair with streaks of gray and a short-trimmed goatee. His inseparable black-rimmed monocle was attached to his breast pocket with a blue silk string. How are things going for the Lark family, dear Count? Lith said while they shook hands. They could go much better. Lark sighed. Looking at how Lith had become as tall as he was and thinking about his achievements, Lark regretted the rumors about Raz being his illegitimate son being lies. Thank the gods we had three rangers this winter. The problem is not the undead, but the panic they cause. Everyone who died during the last few months had their corpse decapitated and a few villages have been decimated due to violent cases of mass hysteria. It's the same everywhere. Lith shrugged. In the north, a traveler who reached a village at night wouldn't live to see the day. People were so scared that they would mercilessly kill any stranger knocking at their doors. How are Jaden and Kelia doing? Great, just great. Maybe too much. After acquiring the assets of my late wife, I let them rule one county each while I supervised their work. Our counties developed so much that my children almost didn't attend their own marriages. 
Never become a feudal lord, dear Lith. It sucks the soul out of you. Lark said before noticing the Martianess glaring at him. E. Leet. Where have you been? We all missed you at the White Griffin Academy. A gentle hand tapped his shoulder, prompting him to turn around. Professor Wainmeyer, I thought you hated social events. Meeting you here is such a pleasant surprise. Lith gave her a bow and a hand kissing. Laika Wainmeyer was one of his favorite professors and the woman who had taught him all he knew about forge mastering. She was a woman in her mid-thirties, 1.65 meters, 5 feet 5 inches, tall, with waist-long black hair with shades of red held up. She was wearing an evening dress and gloves that highlighted her long and nimble fingers. Not even the puffy fabric could hide her soft, luscious curves. It was one of the rare occasions where Professor Wainmeyer would use makeup, making her lovely, heart-shaped face stand out and appear younger than her age. Before Nailier's betrayal, Wainmeyer had a calm and composed attitude, but after being possessed by a slave ring, she had become paranoid and cold. Wainmeyer had stopped trusting people, living as a recluse for over two years. During his time as assistant professor, Lith had been the liaison between her private quarters and the outside world. He had taken care of both the theoretical and practical forge mastering lessons while she struggled with the post-traumatic stress disorder caused by Nailier's orders. This is actually the first time I get out of the White Griffin ever since the accident. Her eyes became veiled for a split second while the ghosts of the past tried to drag her back into her personal hell. Wainmeyer took a deep breath and regained her focus. You never call, never visit, so I thought that meeting my favorite student was the perfect occasion to see how rusty my social skills are. Are you sure you don't want to become a royal forge master? I would be glad to have you as my pupil again. Laika Wainmeyer was one of the youngest and most talented royal forge masters of her generation. It was one of the reasons why the late headmaster Linjos had made her a professor despite the fact that she was way younger than her peers. Even her actions during Nailier's betrayal didn't affect Wainmeyer's skill or reputation. Lith had considered asking her help to learn runesmithing after Orion had declined his request, but the price the kingdom asked was too steep. During the evening, Lith met Professor Vaster and Headmaster Marth, who were flabbergasted learning that Rena's child had survived. If you found Manohar, not revealing his position is an act of treason. Marth said, half joking and half serious. If I did, I would deliver him to you in a body bag. Lith said with a dead serious voice, it was my mentor saving the kid. She's an incredible healer and an even more amazing person. Vaster was trying to have Lith promise that he would introduce such a genius to them when his father, Raz, interrupted their chit-chat. I'm sorry, professors, but I need to steal my son for a while. It's a minor family matter that still requires his attention. We'll be right back. Raz was many things, but a good liar wasn't among them. Everyone understood that something was wrong, but pretended to not notice and didn't ask questions. For a moment, Lith feared that something might have happened to Falco, but he caught a glimpse of Rena amiably talking with Quilla. There was no force on Moger that could keep Rena away from her son if he so much as sneezed, so it had to be something else. Raz led Lith to a servant's passage and then to a secret opening in the wall. Lith found himself inside a hidden living room, without no windows nor doors except that through which he had entered. The entire room was made of solid stone and so heavily enchanted that Lith could feel the hair on his neck standing up. The room was furnished only with a long oval table and many padded wooden chairs. There was no light source except for the magical gemstones embedded into the walls, giving the place an even claustrophobic look. It was the perfect place for torturers and conspirators, so Lith was surprised when he noticed that the person waiting for him was Orion and not Journey. Chapter 926 Secret Meeting Part 2 Happy birthday again, Lith. Sorry for involving your father in this shenanigan, but these days I don't know who I can trust anymore. He said, 
Orion Ernas was a man in his mid-forties over 1.96 meters, 6 feet 5 inches, tall, with black hair and brown eyes like Floria. His physique was lean but muscular, and his perfectly shaven face showed great sadness. Orion had some wrinkles around the eyes and temples, but every movement of his was still full of the vigor one would expect from a much younger man. He and Raz knew each other ever since their respective children had attended the White Griffin Academy. Even though the difference in their social standing was like heaven and earth, the two men carried a deep bond of trust and respect. Thanks. What's going on that requires this kind of secrecy? Lith asked. I will answer to all your questions in due time. First things first. Is it true that you have found a teacher unrelated to the kingdom to teach you advanced magic after your honorable discharge? Orion asked. Yes, Lith said. With both his leave and the military service closing to their end, it was pointless to play it close to the chest. Especially after what had happened with Rena. Do they know runesmithing? My mentor shares my same specializations and none of the chains the kingdom tries to burden me with. What's your point? Lith didn't like being interrogated. My point is that if this guy is as good as you say, then I can uphold my part of our bargain. Orion took one of the plainest bastard swords Lith had ever seen from under his seat and placed it upon the table. It had a silvery blade, cross-shaped guard, and pommel while the grip was black. If not for the line of purple crystals along its fuller and Solus's mana sense, spotting the runes hidden under the surface, Lith would have taken it for a joke. If anyone asks, I never gave it to you. Say that it's a gift from your new master, that you found it at a flea market, on the corpse of one of your enemies, I don't care. Just keep my name out of it. Orion said. Lith caressed the blade, yet he couldn't feel a single spark of magic from it. Even Invigoration found it to be weird, as if it was some kind of magical corpse. What's going on, Orion? Lith asked. I'll tell you what's going on. Floria's trial is still ongoing and things don't look good for neither of you. With a wave of Orion's hand, three glasses and a bottle of Raging Phoenix appeared on the table. It was a liquor so strong that it was mostly meant to be diluted with non-alcoholic beverages, to be used for medical reasons, and to burn corpses to a crisp. What does it have to do with my son? Lith and Raz accepted Orion's offer to sit down along with the liquor. Everything. They took it on Floria first because they gave us Erna's for granted, and because she was the commanding officer. You got away scot-free not because of your performance— but because they were still trying to rope you in. Orion emptied his glass with small, enraged sips. The royal court was afraid that charging you with anything might make you leave the kingdom and offer your talents somewhere else. Now that your voluntary military service is about to end, things escalated from fear to panic. The Magic Empress tried to recruit you when you met in Laurel, and after the existence of the Aura Calcum Skinwalker armor was released to the public, you are considered a leading figure in both the healing and forge mastering field. The kingdom is left with no moves except for those that would lead you to pack up and leave, which makes a lot of people uneasy. Politicians don't like the existence of powerful people they have no control over which led them to the decision of leaving you alone, but at the same time, they have no convenience in helping you anymore. Long story short, I've been forbidden to deliver the sword to you. Orion refilled and emptied his glass before Lith could even taste his own. Are you telling me that the royals are afraid of me? That they don't want to keep their part of our bargain? Lith's gaze shifted from the plain sword to Orion, incapable of deciding which one piqued his curiosity more. Guts. No. They love you. They have been fighting long and hard to protect our respective interests, but they don't run this country alone. The army and the mage association fear that if you received a piece crafted with royal forge mastering techniques, you or your newfound master would be able to reverse engineer it. They can't afford state secrets being leaked to rogue mages or foreign countries, so the official version is that Ruin is the best I could do. Off the record, 
I was ordered to continue my research, but only share it with fellow royal forge masters as I did with your armor. What about this sword? Lith pointed at the blade still in front of him. It's something I worked on during my free time in the privacy of my home, using only methods that I invented myself. In other words, it doesn't exist. Even if you search the whole Mogur, you won't find anything like it. Orion replied with a pride equaled only by his rage. No, what I meant is why are you giving it to me, and aren't you afraid of committing treason? Lith was now more curious than ever, but he liked the Ernest family more than he liked the idea of a new sword. He had yet to learn even the basics of modern runesmithing or witness Faluel's forge mastering skills. He had plenty of ways to procuring him good weapons, maybe even better than ruin, whereas a trustworthy friend was irreplaceable. I'm giving it to you because that was our deal. Thanks to your armor, the royal forge masters discovered how to apply energy-based spells to Aura Calcum. It provided us with the answers we've been looking for decades. Orion said, What the actual hell? Solas thought. She didn't know whether to be more shocked at the idea that Orion had invented his own forge mastering technique or that royal forge mastering was so advanced that they could replicate true magic to such degree. As for committing treason, I'm simply returning the favor in kind. The army betrayed my family by starting a ridiculous trial against my little flower and then by trying to pin the blame for Minoher's escapades on my wife. To add insult to injury, they had the guts to order me to betray my word, to lie to a friend. And in exchange for what? A fucking dog treat. Orion's rage turned his voice into a snarl and his glass into shards. Don't worry about me. Both my family and journeys have played this game long enough to know what we can and cannot do. Believe me when I say that a lot of people are about to discover what happens when we're not happy. Misery likes company and I'm going to make sure that it will host a party no one will ever forget. Orion snapped his fingers, making the shards reform the glass before pouring himself another drink. Chapter 9, 27 Ruin and War Part 1 you know, Lith, back when I crafted Ruin, there was a reason for its name. Wherever you go, shit happens and people die, yet you always thrive. The kingdom almost gets destroyed by a plague and you get rich. The academies almost fall because of bulkier first and nailier later, yet you survive and everyone makes a hero out of you. No matter if the shit rains or pours, you always come on top, fresh like a daisy. Back then, I considered you a scourge, someone who destroys everything he touches, the harbinger of ruin. Hence the sword. Orion sat back on his chair. His voice was now calm. How dare you say such cruel things to my son? I thought we were friends. Raz stood up in outrage. Orion could probably break him in half with only one hand, but what stopped Raz from jumping at his throat was their bond, not fear. We are Raz. I'm sorry, but those were my thoughts back then. I was angry about what had happened to my baby girls and I was looking for someone to blame. It took me a while to realize that no one is at fault but the goddamn ODI and the twice goddamned power games of the royal court. Lith isn't bad luck. Whoever says that is envious, scared, or both. Your son is neither a monster or a hero, just a survivor. Living for too long in peaceful times makes people forget how the lives of those like me and Lith are akin to war. War does not determine who is right, only who is left. Your new sword will ensure that no matter the situation you are in, Lith, you'll be the last man standing. Orion pushed war toward Lith, who hesitated for a second before imprinting it with his mana. The grip of the blade reacted to the imprint by shape-shifting its surface into small spikes that prickled even Litha's hardened skin and made him bleed. The grip sucked the blood along with the mana, and then the entire sword started to change. The red droplets flowed through the metal, activating the pseudocore and revealing the runes hidden under the silvery surface. The blade turned crimson, while the hilt blackened and the guard shape-shifted from a simple cross into upward hooks. 
The round pommel turned into a spike while the blade became wider and the runes rearranged themselves along its surface before becoming invisible again. The entire process lasted barely a second, yet once it was over, the only thing unchanged about War's appearance was the position of the mana crystals aligned on its fuller. What the heck? Lith said after noticing that the wounds on his hand were already healed. War is not like any other sword. Orion said. It changes its appearance to match its user and doesn't tolerate being wielded by anyone else. The enchantments I've imbued it with and the adamant of the blade allow war to always find both its marks and its master, but beware. Never leave it around because the safety protocols don't discriminate between friends and foes. Never unsheathe war unless you plan on using it, because it will refuse to return to its scabbard until it draws blood. What scabbard? Raz stared at the blade in awe. Yet his feelings turned into horror when he noticed that war was exuding a red liquid that engulfed the blade before turning solid. Are you sure you're not going to get in trouble for this? Lith asked. Damn sure. Not even I knew what war would look like after you imprinted it. Only three people know about its existence and all of them are in this room right now. Now let's go back to the ballroom before my missus starts to wonder what the heck we are plotting. Orion said, The following day, city of Valeron, inside the royal castle. The king's council chamber was part of his private apartments, and it was located inside a heavily guarded tower. The room was about 6 meters, 20 feet, long and 4 meters, 13 feet, wide with only a round table and several wooden chairs as furniture. The round table didn't mean that every opinion held the same importance— it was simply the only way to be heard from every side of the room without the need for shouting nonstop. Aside from the furniture, the room was bare, with no windows and only one entrance. Both the floor and the walls were of a pale gray. There was no color outside that of the magical stones the room was made of. The whole place was enchanted to prevent eavesdropping, either by conventional or magical means. It was also equipped with all the necessary protections to avoid the entirety of its occupants from getting killed in one fell swoop. Normally, either the king or the queen would use it to discuss important matters with their respective subjects, the army and the mage association. This time, however, the rulers of the kingdom were presiding over the meeting together. The upper echelons of both the most powerful and important institutions of the Griffin Kingdom had been summoned to deliberate about the situation at hand. I think you are just overreacting. Archmage Court, the chairman of the association, said. Who cares if Ferhen quits the army? As long as his family lives here, we have leverage above him. Manipulating someone through the people they held dear is the basic of the basics. He's gotten too conceited because the Queen's Corps has always protected that shithole he calls home. Leave Lisha without detail for one week and Verhen will be the one coming to us, begging for help. Only the gods know how many enemies he's made over the years among the members of all the four races. My not-so-much-esteemed colleague is forgetting that Lith Verhen made himself those enemies while serving the kingdom. Miram Distar the supreme commander of the Queen's Corps said. If we follow his advice, what message are we sending to our loyal subjects? Thanks for your service, but we'll discard you the moment you're no longer needed. Her voice was oozing sarcasm. Hasn't the Ernazes situation already done enough damage? What the commander is forgetting, probably due to her age, is that's exactly the purpose of this meeting. Quartz's voice was as sweet as an unripe lemon. Sending the message that people serve the kingdom and not the other way around. The Ernas are just like Verhen. They think to be above the law, to be special. It's time to remind them that personal success doesn't grant special treatment. In this time of turmoil, using double standards can only backfire. Think of what happened with Akala. You have showered Verhen with so much glory that a good man who had honorably served the kingdom all his life fell prey to the bright day just because he felt unappreciated. I couldn't disagree more, Brigadier General Barian said. 
It's not a matter of double standards so much as to reward merit. Back in his day, Ranger Akala did a decent job, sure, but Ranger Verhen destroyed the Black Star, got us two ancient ODI ruins, and I could go on for hours. If we treat them the same way, then why should the next Verhen put his life on the line if excellency is rewarded the same as mediocrity? Chapter 9, 28 Ruin and War Part 2 Please, you're saying that only because Verhen earned you that star, Commander Baryon, General Morn Griffin said. I agree with Court. Now that we know from reliable sources that Verhen wants to cut ties with the kingdom, we must remind him that he needs us more than we need him. How can someone sharing the royal blood be so stupid? Queen Silpha had enough of that nonsense. If not for King Marone holding her wrist, she would have already ripped a few heads off. Silpha wasn't big on diplomacy. At least not when someone threatened the peace she had fought so long to protect. What if some stupid noble takes the removal of the detail as our silent approval and Lusha gets raided by bandits? We've just got rid of one Balkir, and you want to create another? My queen, I resent. Morn tried to say, I resent letting you live. Silpha snarled while tugging her hand so hard that Marone almost lost his grip. Almost. The general of the army wasn't a meek man, but he had fought alongside the queen on the battlefield, and those memories still haunted his sleep. Marone was the only thing standing between Morn and a closed casket funeral. To make matters worse, the general knew his cousin well enough to understand that Marone nearly letting his wife go was no accident, but a message. What the queen means is that we must always look at the bigger picture. The king said, It's not just one Verhen we are talking about. His sister is also a very promising young mage, and now there are five more candidates that might have inherited their talent or that will at least receive their magical legacy. If the Verhens really are a new magical bloodline, the kingdom can't afford to lose all of them because of petty short-arm thinking. As for the Ernas, I'm tired of hearing people belittling them. They are both living heroes and pillars of the kingdom. If I had to judge the court based on the Ernas' standards of merit, I'd have to say that I'm surrounded only by incompetent idiots, present company included. During her career, Lady Ernas has rooted out more corruption by herself than entire departments since their founding. It's only thanks to her foresight that we have brought valuable people like Camilla Yeval into our fold. Despite her humble upbringing, she has proven to be a loyal and resourceful subject of the kingdom. Lieutenant Yeval is also one of the few tethers that can induce great mage Verhen to keep supporting our country in the future. As for Lord Ernas, he has made countless contributions to the development of royal forge mastering techniques, and very few can equal his craftsmanship. He's the reason you are able to equip your new armor and blades. Losing the Verhens might endanger the kingdom's future, but losing the Ernas would be a blow we could never recover from. An awkward silence followed Marone's words. Despite her anger, Silpha waited for her husband's speech to seep through the thick wall that seemed to shield the brains of half of those present from common sense before talking. It's also worth pointing out that Verhen seems to have a privileged channel with the emperor beasts that inhabit the kingdom. Headmaster Marth is barely able to follow in the footsteps of Linjos in that regard, whereas Lith seems to have befriended several powerful beings. Any news on his newfound mentor, Miram? Silpha asked. Yes, your majesty. Basing my investigation on his words, I discovered that he is going to receive the teachings of Faluel the Hydra. The Martianess replied. How can you be so sure? Archmage Court jumped up while the entire room went into uproar. The Hydra bloodline had ruled the Distar Marquiate since ancient times. They had helped Vaelron, the first king, to unify the kingdom and later to protect its borders. Faluel herself had aided the royals several times, but always as a mercenary. No amount of wealth or land had ever been enough to make Hydras willing to share their secrets. Emperor beasts respected humans but didn't trust them. People like Faluel would offer their services, but never their loyalty. 
I asked her. Destar's tone was so sour that everyone could hear the Udimwit that had remained unspoken. Interesting. The queen was now calm, drumming her fingers on the table while ignoring the commotion around her. First Lark, then the Martianess, then the Academy, and now Faluel. It seems that the young Verhen is progressively climbing the power ladder. Indeed. The king nodded. No matter if this is deliberate or just a coincidence, we have only one path ahead. The same day, Litha's house. The second part of Litha's birthday was exclusive to his family members. Usually, he wouldn't even bring along his current girlfriend, reserving for her the time after dinner. The previous year, he had made an exception because he had only one day off and he couldn't take any more being caught in the crossfire between his family and Camilla, who were both nagging at him to know each other. It was the reason why when he brought Camilla, Zinya, and her children over for dinner, everyone squirmed in anticipation for the big announcement they could see coming from a mile away. I hope the next year will bless us with as many grandchildren as the last. Alina whispered in Raz's ears while making sure that her words would be perfectly audible while she moved her eyes from Lith to Tista. Are you sure you want to do it? Tista said, showing everyone what a real whisper looked like. Yes. If you don't want to, feel free to fake surprise. The only thing I ask you is to help me soften the blow for them. Lith whispered as well. I'm not leaving you alone, little brother. Tista was scared as much as Lith was. Scared of rejection, scared of their family blaming them for their lies. Worst case scenario, we'll get the boot together and I'll move with you to Solus's tower. Both chuckled at those words, prompting Camilla to pull his sleeve. Are you sure you want to do it? She had no idea what an awakened was, nor that Lith was about to come clean about both his secrets. I know that I'm the one who told you there's nothing to worry about, but with all that's happened, I'm afraid that everyone's nerves are still quite shaken. Yes, I'm sure. Then take a deep breath and relax. I'll be at your side all the way. Camilla held his hand under the table, happy to see how Comlith was. I'm glad our planning and rehearsing paid off. She thought. He's much more confident now. I'm glad our planning and rehearsing paid off. Lith thought. Now that I'm able to control my upper body, no one can notice my legs shaking under the table. Raz was disappointed when the dinner came to its end and yet nothing happened. Damn. I hoped that between all the bad things Lith has witnessed during his military service and Orion's speech, my son would finally settle down. If even his friends see him in a negative light, I'm afraid of what might happen once Lith is out there on his own. Chapter 929 Upside Down Part 1 I don't want Lith suffering Floria's same fate. Neither of them deserves such treatment, but at least she has several powerful households supporting her. I'm just a farmer who lives in the house my son built and cultivates the lands he bought. Aside from my unconditional love, there's nothing I can offer to him. Raz thought. His disappointment was in good company, but it turned into confusion after Lith asked Zinya to take Lyria and Aaron home with her. The confusion was replaced by amazement less than a minute later when Celia knocked on their door. No one had seen the Huntress for five years since her sudden and mysterious disappearance during Litha's fourth year at the White Griffin Academy. Not only did she seem to not have aged a day, but she was also in the company of a red-haired giant who she introduced as her husband. Oh, Celia, I'm so happy to see you again, Alina said while hugging her long-lost friend. You had me worried sick. How could you leave like that without saying goodbye or even leaving a note? Celia Fastero was supposed to be in her late thirties, yet she looked to be barely past her mid-twenties. She was still 1.7, 5 feet 7 inches, meters tall and her skin was tanned from the years of long exposure to the sun. Her black hair was now longer than the last time Alina had seen her, reaching her shoulders and giving her a gentler look. She wore a heavy fur coat over a cream-colored dress and snow boots. 
Lith was amazed seeing Celia's sharp eyes become veiled with tears of emotion, but even more by seeing her wearing a skirt for the first time in his life. She never wore a dress nor makeup for you, Solas thought. Celia must be really desperate to make a good impression on your family. After all, if they have trouble accepting your hybrid nature, there's no way she can fit back in your lives. I'm so sorry, Alina. I really hope you can forgive me for what I did, Celia said amid tears. Of course I can, Celia. The only thing that really matters is that now you're home now. Alina's surprise grew, noticing how emotional the huntress was. Not even Celia had predicted how many memories returning to Lucia after so many years would have stirred inside her heart. Everything was different yet identical to how she remembered it. The fields covered in snow, the scent of the Tron woods carried by the wind, and the voices of the only people she had ever considered like her family made her guts tie in a knot. Alina welcoming Celia home had been the final blow that made her emotional walls crumble. The fact that their respective houses were nearly identical didn't help her keep her cool either. I can't believe this oaf lacks even a spark of originality. She sobbed harder as all eyes moved on the oaf by her side, waiting for an explanation to the odd remark. She speaks the truth. I don't. Ryman scratched his head in embarrassment. After he had found a proper place where to settle down, equally distant from Faluel's lair and from a human settlement, Protector wanted to give his wife the perfect home. He had received so much from Celia, and after forcing her to leave Lucia, her happiness was his first priority. The problem was that he had no idea what made a human home comfortable, so he had built their love nest based on the projects stored inside Litha's memories. The only changes made to the original design were those Celia had requested him. While the rest of the family welcomed Celia, half shocked and half moved from the sudden reunion, Lith shook hands with Protector. How do you feel, Lith? Ryman asked with his usual stoic voice. Calm like someone who is about to be chased by an angry mob armed with pitchforks and torches. Lith replied, hiding behind his best poker face. That makes the two of us. After all that time, Ryman was still amazed by how scary those small people that he could break with one hand were. They couldn't harm a hair on his body, yet they could easily break the heart of the woman he loved and hurt their children. The cruelty of humans never failed to impress him. Your face looks familiar. Have we met before? Raz was curious about the familiarity his son displayed with Celia's boyfriend. Lith smiled a lot in public, but those were just an act. Seeing Lith without his mask despite the presence of a stranger made a good impression on Raz. Yes, I lived in your village for a short while, but that's a long story and it's not for me to say it. Ryman replied, Is this baby spit? Rena asked after recognizing the familiar smell coming from Celia's clothes. Gods, I was certain to have cleaned it up. I really have to learn how to use magic. She had fed Fenrir before leaving and the burp had left a stain that Celia had hastily tried to remove. Congratulations. Rena hugged her sister in arms. Motherhood was a fierce battle that had cost her most of the clothes Lith didn't forge master. Is it your first? Third, actually. More congratulations ensued while Sentin and Raz patted Protector's shoulders. Between Litha's approval and Celia trusting him enough to start a family with him, the stranger had to be a good man. After hearing from Rena about her triplets and sharing with her a few anecdotes about her own children, Celia started to explain to Litha's family how she had met Protector and the reason that had forced them to leave. At first, they had moved from Lusha to a nearby village just to avoid Lith discovering that Protector was still alive, but after Lilia's birth, they had relocated to a safe place after the scared neighbors had tried to harm the baby. Everyone now remembered the stranger that had lived with Celia before her disappearance and protector was still dearly mourned. The members of Litha's family knew how deep his bond with the allegedly late Ri was and honored his sacrifice to protect the students of the academy from Balkyrus monsters. 
Accepting that they were actually the same person and alive at that shook their nerves quite a bit. He, I mean you, oh gods. Alina was so shocked that she was incapable of coming up with a coherent sentence. Everyone kept moving their eyes from Celia to Ryman, expecting them to say it was all a joke at any moment. Yet nothing happened. Camilla was sitting next to the huntress, holding her hand to give Celia strength and courage. Even Tista didn't know what to say, and she was on friendly terms with several emperor beasts. She looked around the room, looking for something to say that wouldn't sound incredibly rude. Then she noticed that neither Lith nor Camilla showed any hint of surprise on their faces. You knew? Tista was glad to change the topic. For how long? I knew that he was an emperor beast from the beginning, but I only discovered that Protector was still alive less than a year ago. Lith replied, I never told you because I knew it would have been hard to accept and because it wasn't up to me revealing someone else's secrets. I asked them to come here tonight because Celia would like to return to Lusha and I got something to tell you. Chapter 930 Upside Down Part 2 Lith explained to them how Protector had helped him in Xantia and later introduced him to their common mentor, Faluel. Wait, are you saying that hot woman was a Hydra? Raz felt as Mogur had suddenly turned upside down. He had no idea who might be human and who was an imposter. The thought scared him so much that he looked at Camilla in suspicion. How can you find hot a girl old enough to be your daughter? Alina snarled. She's actually several hundreds of years old, Ryman said, trying to calm them down but achieving the opposite. The room was about to erupt in chaos and panic when Tista said, Wait, there's something I don't understand. Even though I'm still scared shitless at the idea that some creatures can change their appearance like I change my clothes, I don't get why Faluel accepted to help you so much. I mean, an emperor beast teaching to a human is unheard of except that in fairy tales. That's the whole point of this meeting, Lith said. In a few months, I will be done with the army and I will be staying at Faluel's until the end of my apprenticeship. It could last months or even years and I don't want to lie to you about where I am and what I'm doing. To allow you to understand the reason behind my choice of career path and why I can't trust the Griffin Kingdom, I need to show you something. Lith took off his shoes and had the shirt of the Skinwalker armor disappear, remaining bare-chested. He wanted them to witness how deep the changes his body would undergo after shapeshifting, and he didn't want the clothes to hide the scales or the talons. Oh, gods! Tista gasped while shielding her eyes with her hands, yet leaving the fingers spread out enough so as to not have any problem seeing. While his daughter was blushing up to her ears, Alina looked at her son with one hand placed above her heart and eyes, full of wonder that Lith would expect in someone looking at a work of art like Michelangelo's Pieta for the first time. Rina instinctively felt her husband's strong, muscular arms typical of a blacksmith, before moving down to Senton's soft belly typical of a sedentary lifestyle. I promise you I will exercise, but now please stop comparing me with him. Senton felt so embarrassed that he wanted to die. He was still a young man, yet Lith made him feel an old coot. Oh my, I love it when they do that. It never gets old. Celia's reddened cheeks, while she nudged Camilla, made Litha's girlfriend incredibly embarrassed yet proud, as if she was being congratulated for something she had contributed to making. What the heck is wrong with them? This isn't anything like I had predicted this would play. Lith couldn't understand why the tension in the room was gone, nor why it had been replaced by an awkward feeling. It's not the first time they see me half-naked. When I was recovering from saving Protector's life, you were just twelve. Solus cut him short. And you were also all skin and bones due to fatigue. Oh. Only then did Lith realize the extent of his miscalculation. Oh, indeed. Solus had to agree with Celia. She never got tired of that kind of show. No impurities meant no imperfections during the growth spurt. No moles. No excess body hair nor fat. 
Lith had the build of an Olympic athlete at his prime, with broad shoulders and muscles that looked like they had been chiseled rather than trained. God damn it, stop staring. This isn't a strip show, what I meant to show you is this. Lith shapeshifted into his hybrid form, becoming over two meters, seven foot, tall while his pink skin turned into black scales, whose tips were reddened by the inner fire burning within. The change almost happened as if his body was comprised of domino tiles that were being flipped in a chain reaction. Razor-sharp claws replaced Litha's nails and talons grew on his toes and heel, making his feet resemble those of a bird of prey. New limbs came out of his back, with a short tail full of bone spikes growing out of his spine, as well as a set of black membranous wings that erupted from his shoulder blades. They stretched to either side of the room for a second before wrapping around his body like a mantle. The wings were twisted and unnatural, like the hands of a giant resting on his shoulders. Litha's face was now a black slate, apparently without a mouth or nose. Two small curved horns came out of his temples while his three eyes looked at those present. Despite the fact that the house was warm and Lith wasn't emitting a single shred of killing intent, the members of his family felt a cold shiver running down their spines. Their stomachs were twisted in a knot, each one for a different reason. Alina jumped up, walking in front of Lith and examining him as if she was seeing her son for the first time. Does turning into this thing hurt? Her face was pale and her breath short. Who or what did this to you? Was it Valkyr? Was it the goddamn army with its experiments? Is this the reason why we couldn't see you for so many months? The last two questions were coded in an unbridled fury that surprised Lith. He would have never expected that a person as kind as his mother could harbor so much anger. Lith shook his head and told her about his first tribulation in Candria, how things had started to change, both inside and outside of him, and how those changes had become deeper over time. Are you saying that this started when you were still a student? That this is. She had no words for it, only fear. What is this thing? It's not a thing. It's a part of me. Some say that I resemble a dragon, others a demon, but they all agree on the term hybrid. Litha's voice was calm while he tried to answer, to the best of his abilities. Raz was incapable of moving from his chair as doubts and insecurities ravaged his mind. I always knew that Lith was too smart and powerful to really be my son. He had started doubting Litha's paternity way before hearing the word hybrid. The moment Raz had seen Lith shapeshift, ugly thoughts had popped inside his mind like mushrooms in a damp cave. If emperor beasts can assume human form, then Alina might have been unfaithful to me, and that thing might not be my son. Raz was an honest man, but the paranoia Lith had infected him with now made him expect the worst from people. Rena didn't squeeze sentence so hard ever since her first childbirth, almost breaking his fingers, yet he didn't even notice. Rena couldn't stop shifting her gaze from Lith to Alina and then to Raz, wondering which one of her parents was actually an emperor beast. Mom cheating on dad it's impossible and Lith is my brother. I saw him being born and my blood is screaming to me that thing is the same person I held to my chest for years. The only possible explanation is that one of my parents lied to me all my life. 